growing up in Scotland was the best start anyone could hope for. Dundee is like a, a big village. Everybody looks out for it, everybody else. I, I didn't really know that racism existed elsewhere in the country, whereas of course in the 70s and 80s it did. Uh, but whatever was happening in other places, it wasn't happening in Dundee. We were treated like everybody else. Home life uh, was uh, happy. We were uh, your average middle class family. Dad came from India at the age of 17 with, with nothing. He started off selling vegetables door to door. In the evenings he studied. By the time I was born, um, in 1968, uh, he had a university degree, a PhD, and he just got his first lecturing job at Dundee University. I'm not sure I started off with a goal, actually. Um, it's just that I went to see my careers advisor at school, and at that point I wasn't doing particularly well at school. Uh, I'm dyslexic, and so I was used to being in the bottom class for most subjects. And I said to her that I quite liked the idea of going to university, and she just laughed at me and said I should consider something else like hairdressing. I think by the time I went to university, um, I worked out how to deal with the dyslexia. And of course, in those days, you weren't di diagnosed in the way that uh, people are now. I just knew that uh, I couldn't read for very long without getting a bit tired. And my spelling was, and still is, appalling. Um, but somehow, the law fascinated me. The arguments that people put forward and the way that judges structured uh, their judgments. And so it, it just didn't, it just wasn't a problem when it came to studying law in the way that it was for other subjects. When I qualified um, and got my degree, um, I had a degree in English and Scots law. So there were lots of choices that I could make. And I thought it'd be quite a good idea to see if my, I could persuade my dad to let me leave home for a year. And I did manage to do that. And I did it by saying that I should come to London and study for the bar. But I had no intention of practicing. What I was planning to do was have a year out, uh, like a gap year really, and then go home again. I was extremely lucky. Um, just by chance, I joined Gray's Inn. And there I met my best friends, really. And I uh, was given a scholarship by Gray's Inn. And that meant that funding was just simply not a problem for me. And then one of the other students that I met studying for the bar suggested I should apply for pupillage. And I thought that sounded like a good idea. And so I did. And I thought, well, I'll just spend another year in London and then I'll go home. Uh, and I really did land on my feet. I did pupillage at a commercial set uh, in the temple. And my pupil master uh, was the most fantastic man. Uh, he, again, he didn't see race and he didn't see gender. Uh, and I had the most just fantastic experience and time with him. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to leave. Um, and so I decided that commercial law was not for me, uh, but that I quite fancied doing a bit of court work. Um, and he sent me across the road to a criminal set, and I spent the next 23 years there. I had appreciated, because you, you couldn't fail to really, that the bar was made up of predominantly white males from a particular background, Many had been to Oxford or Cambridge, you know, universities that I wouldn't have even thought of applying to. And that the life experience of, of those people at the bar was completely different to my life experience. So I started off being really quite grateful for everything that came my way. Um, I was doing a job I loved. Um, and that was enough to keep me happy. But I didn't, in the early years, expect to be treated in the same way as my, my white male counterparts. And just as well, actually. <laughs> because I don't think there are many women of my age who would say that they were treated equally. 
I can remember early on when the clerks controlled the diaries of all the barristers, that cases would just be moved around. And even if a case had come in in your name, if it was a good case and there was a, a male that uh, was maybe a couple of years more senior to you who didn't have a good case uh, for that week, they'd just move your case across and you would have a case that wasn't as good. And that would happen frequently. In the first few years, I worked extremely hard. And of course, if you do that, uh, there is a reward to it. And there was. I got bigger and better cases, uh, and solicitors would phone up for me and ask for me. And so I ended up developing um, quite a big practice. So by the time I was in my late 30s, I really did have quite a busy and successful and varied practice. I did a lot of different cases. So murders here at the Old Bailey, but fraud cases, and then the public law cases were coming in for me, um, and then uh, the odd civil case as well. Getting silk was the best day of my life. It really was. I didn't think I would ever get silk. By then, I had my three children, so they were able to come and share the day with me. My parents were both there, my sisters were there. I think I felt I just had it all. I'd always wanted a family, and I had a family. Three fantastic children. I'd always loved my job, otherwise I wouldn't have stayed doing it. And so I'd had the privilege of having a, a, a job. It's not really a job, it's more of a, it's just more of a vocation. You either enjoy it, and then you do it, or you don't, and then you go and do something else. There came a time when actually that balance between um, what I wanted to do at home with my children and the amount of work I was doing at the bar it was uh, not in a place that I was happy with. I had to make a decision. Now either I outsourced looking after my children or something had to give with my career. And so I'd enjoyed sitting as a recorder. I hadn't done much of it. In fact, recorders are part-time judges. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what I'll do is I'll apply to become a judge. And there was a particular exercise on for judges sitting in serious crime. And I thought, well, I might enjoy that. And I applied for it, not expecting to get it. Um, and I did get it. I found changing from being an independent barrister um, in charge of my own diary uh, and able to say really whatever I wanted uh, to being a member of the judiciary uh, quite difficult. Uh, I think you get used to arguing cases in front of people and uh, expressing your views forcefully at times if need be. And as a member of the judiciary, one of the skills that you are meant to have is the ability to listen. And you're not a very good judge if you can't do that. When I walk into my courtroom every day, I decide how everyone in that courtroom is treated. How do we speak to defendants? How do you treat them and make sure that when there is a trial happening, they are at actually actively involved in that trial and can understand everything that's been said and done in the case rather than uh, as can happen if you use archaic and formal uh, language uh, spectators how do you talk to the jury and make sure that they can understand how important they are in the criminal justice system so all of those people in my courtroom on a daily basis for them I am that day, I am the rule of law in action. So my husband is a High Court judge. He is currently one of the two presiding judges on the North Eastern Circuit. It means, of course, that for half of the judicial year, he is based in the North East rather than in London. One of the uh, huge advantages of uh, being a part of the judiciary is that you can apply for part-time work. And that it comes in all shapes and sizes. 
So you can either work 90% or 80%, some judges even work 50%. And so now I work as a 90% judge. And that means that when the children are on holiday, I'm on holiday with them. That also fits in with the way uh, that my husband works. I'm very impressed by what I see the Judicial Appointments Commission. Uh, the statutory duty of the Judicial Appointments Commission is to appoint judges on merit and that is what they do. And the processes are very rigorous, there are lots of checks and balances, everybody is committed uh, to making sure that we appoint judges that are of the highest calibre. So I feel, and I've always felt it, uh, it's a huge privilege um, and, and one um, I, I can't believe really that um, I've had the opportunity to be involved in what, what I think is a fantastic system.